thank you that we can let it be you, that we won't let temptation come into our life, God, that you are our stronghold and you are our foundation, God, that we're just able to hold firm to you and let it be nothing but you, God. I thank you for your love that it remains longer than anything that we can have. I pray for Kyle that he, as he comes and preaches this morning that we'll just be able to take in your word. We'll be able to live it out throughout the week. I pray this in your name. Amen. All righty. Good morning, everybody. Looky there. I managed to get the mic working the first time this time. I think that is the first time it has ever happened. All righty. Thank you very much, Will. Um, as always, just a, just a fantastic job, man. Um, so this morning, um, as we get started, I want to I share some statistics with you right as we, get out the, right as we come out of the gate. Um, one, because I'm a nerd and I like statistics. Um, but two, because I think they're going to be a little bit shocking, um, at least to some extent. But I want it to set the stage for us. There was a study that was just conduct- conducted by the Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion. Dr. Hathaway and Dr. Marker conducted this study to begin taking a look at the numbers that some of the census polls had just brought out over the last couple of years. Because a few years ago, another, another, the Census Bureau had come out with a study that suggested that only 40% of Americans attended church. According to Dr. Hathaway and Dr. Marker, they found that this number was actually only 17%. 17% of Americans regularly attend church. 17%. I'm going to add to this study another one conducted by the the Barna Group in 2015 that found that only 2 in 10 Americans under the age of 30 consider church attendance to be important at all. Now, I'm going to put that in perspective. That doesn't mean that these individuals do not attend church. It just means that 2 out of every 10 people under the age of 30 believe that church is absolutely not beneficial. Also in this particular study, they said 59% of those young people that had been raised up in church had either dropped out at some point during this time or no longer attended church in any way, shape, form, or fashion. 59% of people underneath 30 who who were brought up in church, who were raised in church, now looked at church and said they wanted nothing to do with it and they were no longer attending. Out of this number, another 35% were openly hostile to the church. Now, again, this doesn't mean that these individuals had gone all the way to the realm of atheism, but what I mean when I say hostile, it means that they would actually come up to you and say, no, church is not beneficial. Church is going to do nothing more than hinder you, hurt you. It's a place filled with hypocrites or liars or any other number of things. Depending on the study or, or how deep you look into it, the answers vary. The big takeaway here, though, was these studies also concluded the major reason for the falling out mostly of millennials, inside of the church today. Now, before I go any further, I don't want you to feel like I'm targeting millennials, all right, because I fall into that bracket. Uh, Technically, I was shocked by that number, too. I was like, no, I'm not a millennial. I'm 31. That means I got outside of the group, right? No. Uh, Anybody from 1980 all the way forward, if you're in that bracket, you're trapped. You're one of us. It, it, It is what it is. But these studies have found out that millennials in droves are leaving the church. They're abandoning the church left, right, and sideways. So why is that? Why would such a giant group of people decide that church was no longer beneficial? Why would they walk away from the faith? Why would they decide that this is not something that they could hold on to? The reasons boil down to a few different things, some of them being something as simple as that the church has failed to reach them uh, in a way that that speaks to the way that they like to to consume information, okay? That that churches don't embrace new social media and those kinds of things. Some Some of these things were were mentioned in the study in, in these various studies, but the one that ran through all of them, the common theme in every one of these places is that they said the faith was not real. The theology that was preached from the pulpit, they didn't see in the real world. It didn't line up. It didn't jive. They said, oh, there were some really high-minded theological statements being made, but none of these were things that they could imply, apply in their actual life. They didn't meet them where they were at. They didn't discuss real issues or real struggles or real pains. They were like, There are things I want to talk about. There are real things that I want the answers to, and the church won't touch these. They're going to spend their entire time discussing my salvation, but they won't talk to me about how to walk this path of sanctification 
that they keep preaching about and saying, oh, grow more like Jesus, but they won't tell us how. They won't tell us how should we talk about difficult subjects like homosexuality. How can we deal with some of these newer problems that have arisen in the church day? How do we handle the fact that there are still so many poor in the country? How do we handle so many tough issues that the church just won't tackle? Or when they tackle it, they'll say something very nice, but they won't give us something real. This was the number one reason consistently given for why millennials were walking away from the church. Now, here's the thing. If we were honest with ourselves, it's not just millennials who have felt like this before. Probably at least once in your life, you have felt the despair of the difference between nice theology and real-world action, where you went, okay, that's a nice thought, but how does this work for me? How do I apply this in my life? As we've been going through this sermon series on the heart, we've been trying to plug into just that reality. We've been trying to tell you how to guard your heart because guarding your heart is where the metal meets the meat. It's where the real fight begins out there. We've talked about a lot of things, about finding our satisfaction in Jesus. We've talked about what it even means to guard our heart and why that's such a giant duty. Today, we're going to talk about getting real, all right? We're going to talk about three ways to get real in guarding our heart during trials, Okay, we're going to do this out of, out of the book of James uh, in chapter number one, and we're going to be working through verses two through eight. So if you guys want to go ahead and start turning into that direction as I, as I continue on here. Um, the phenomenon that we've just been talking about has actually become so prevalent in our society that Dr. Ravi Zacharias has actually just written a book about it called Has Christianity Failed You? If you haven't picked that book up, if you haven't seen it, It's an excellent resource. I suggest you take a look at that one. Um, The man is incredibly brilliant, um, and and trust me, he can can put this in a spin in such a way uh, that I never could. Now, he's not specifically talking about what we're talking about, guarding the heart, but if the larger issue has already intrigued you, uh, go over there and take a look at that one. So as I said, today we're going to talk about three ways to get real about facing trials in our lives. Now, the book of James as we've been talking about getting real, the book of James is all about getting real with the faith. In fact, it's been called the Proverbs of the New Testament. The realness of what's happening inside of this very book is one of the things that caused, uh, caused Martin Luther, the big hero guy that, that came out and finally exposed the Catholic Church for a lot of the different frauds and things that it was doing at that time frame in history. It called, James, it called him to look at it and go, man, this is a, 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 a right straw epistle. He didn't, he didn't like it, but partially because it didn't line up with the book of Romans. He felt like there was a giant contradiction between the two. Later on, Calvin would come back in and say, no, there's no contradiction here at all. This is just preaching on two different standpoints, where Luther was looking over and seeing Paul preaching out of the book of Romans and talking about the theology of being saved by faith, and that's the foundation stone of your faith. You turned around and looked at James, and James said, now that you have that foundation stone, what do we do with this? How do we live in the real world with our faith? So James is all about the real world faith. James, in fact, is very practical. James, in this particular subject, is not not the apostle James. We're talking about James, the half-brother of Jesus, okay? James, the half-brother of Jesus, if you will remember, is one of the very many people that is looking out from his family at Jesus when he comes back home and says, what in the world? This is just Jesus. This is my brother. He's not one of the ones following Jesus around. In fact, he looks at Jesus and he's like, this is not... The whole time during his earthly ministry, he's like, no, this is not it. He's not following him. It's not until after the resurrection that James has seen something so profound that it will lead James all the way to his death. They will eventually martyr James. And all he had to do was say, no, my brother Jesus is not Christ. He is not the living God in the flesh. That's all he had to say. But instead he chose and went, no, I'm, I'm telling you that this is who this man is. He is, in fact, Christ. I have seen it with my own two eyes, and it is so real that I can do nothing. I cannot deny it. And he went all the way to his death with that very statement. He was even known as the camel, um, which is a, a really strange nickname to give him, but they gave him that because they said that he had, so, he had so many scabs on his knees from praying so long day in and day out. This was a man who believed in the realness, the day-to-day reality of faith. And when he writes to all of the different um, Jews who are in dispersion, the Christians who are now spread out, he's writing to them 
not just about a high-minded theology. He's writing to them and saying, now that you have this faith, this saving grace, how do we get real? Now, I'm going to read this, this, this passage out for you, and then we'll, we'll go on into our different methods here. Starting in verse number 2 in the letter of James in the first chapter, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that these, the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. And we're going to stop there. We're going to focus in on these very passages and hammer out everything we can about guarding our hearts during times of trial. And the very first one may seem absolutely simple, but we're going to start in verse number two. And the very first way to get real about trials is embrace the truth of the trial. Embrace the truth of the trial. What do I mean by that? In verse number two, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. He doesn't say if. He doesn't say you might meet a trial. He says when you meet these trials. It's an assumption inside of his very sentence. It's an assumption on everything else that follows after it. He's not talking about some niceness. He's saying, look, you're going to face hard times in life. Let's get real about it. You will face trials and difficulties and struggles. But part of the problem is in the church, we don't talk like that today, do we? We don't talk about trials. Now, we may talk about suffering, and we may say that we will suffer for our faith, and that we might be martyred for our faith, and we'll talk about that in glorious and high and mighty tones, but we don't talk about the day-to-day trials. We don't talk about the fact that at work today, you've got that one coworker who is going to drive you bonkers all day long. And at the end of the day, you're like, oh, I just, I just want to, I just want to slap them. I just want to. You're struggling against that. You know that oh, Christ would call me to do something different, but, uh, and we're not going to come in here on Sunday when they say, how was your week? And go, well, I struggled. I faced all kinds of trials and temptations this week dealing with that one guy. We don't say that. We don't say that because we don't, it doesn't make us look very Christian-like. And it's not the kind of thing we want to admit to one another. We don't want to be that kind of transparent because to be transparent is to be vulnerable. We also don't want to admit the more difficult trials. That one's kind of funny, but what if, what if we've been struggling all week with something deeply profound? What if our faith has been shaken to its absolute core? What if we walk in this week and we say, I just, I am struggling with whether or not God is good I've had such pain, such suffering, such hurt. This week, I wonder if God is good at all. I know that he is. I know that he is because the scripture tells me that. But right now, because of what I'm experiencing, because of what I'm facing, I am struggling under this trial and this fight, and I don't know if he is. Would you be willing to tell somebody that when you walk through the doors of the church? The answer for most people is no. When they ask you how your week went, you might go, huh, it's a little tough, but, but, but God's good. Praise be to God. Amen. Praise God. And we'll go and we'll get on our pews and we won't say anything at all. And we'll believe everything is going good. We might, we might say, hey, I have an I have a, I have a, a unspoken prayer request. We might get so bold as to go there, but that would be as far as we're going to go. And that's not a bad thing, okay? I'm not saying that you have to, you have to, to air out everything in, in everyday life. But what I'm saying is, is we don't feel comfortable going there. Because we feel like because we're facing trials, that somehow that lessens us. It makes us lesser of a Christian because this trial has somehow marked us and made us, made us not as good. Or because maybe we failed in that trial. Because here's the thing. I'm going to admit something to you right here. I have faced all kinds of trials this week, and I have failed at most of them. Now, I'm preaching in front of you, and I'm telling you openly I have sinned this week. I have not acted like a Christian at various moments throughout this week. And when I say I haven't acted like a Christian, I have failed in some serious ways that I would be absolutely ashamed when that tape recorder goes off in heaven. Jesus would be like, mm, you know that moment? And I go, mm-hmm, yeah, just, just, go on, let's, just move on to the next one, please. I have faced trials this week. But we feel, we don't feel comfortable with that because we feel like if we tell that to our brother sitting to the left or right of us, they're going to 
quote-unquote, judge us and think less of us. The reality of the matter, though, when I say embrace the truth of the trial, is that trials are part of Christian life. If you walk into this building today and say that you have not faced a trial, I will laugh. Everybody should, because you will face trials in your life. They're part of the reality of what is. It doesn't make you less of a Christian. It doesn't make you any, anyhow, any more, um, it doesn't diminish the value that you have. It doesn't take away from you in any way, shape, form, or fashion. It makes you a real world Christian living in a fallen world, still striving towards sanctification day by day. But don't take my word for it. Remember how I said a few weeks ago, don't, don't listen to me. All right, now, we've already looked at where he said it in James, where James said, count it all joy when you face trials, not if you face trials. He's under the assumption, talking to this church, that they are facing trials then and there that he's talking to them about. But likewise, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 6, he said, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So Peter is talking to them again by, about trials, saying that you are being grieved by trials. Paul will write to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 1, 4. He says, Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. Now here Paul says something really amazing. When I, he says, The trials are a point for me to go out to everybody else in the world and say, You're standing up under trials. And this is the thing that I am bragging to everyone else in the world about you facing. The trials are not something that he looks at as a mark of shame, but a mark of pride. He says, every time you stand that test of the trial, every time you stand up underneath affliction and pain and struggle, he goes, I'm telling your dirty laundry, the things you're facing, the struggles you're fighting against, I'm telling these things to everyone in the rest of the Christian world as a boastful thing. I praise God that you've stood up underneath it. Likewise, in Hebrews chapter number 11, verses 32 through 38, says, And what more shall I say? For time would fail t- for me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even in chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about it in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and of caves of the earth. Now, why do I bring up this passage? These are real deal trials. The writer of Hebrews is pointing these things out in this giant lecture on faith and saying, these are paragons of the faith. And he'll go on right at the beginning of of chapter 12, which we'll read here in just a little bit. He goes on in chapter 12 to say that these are people who have gone before you to testify the reality of the faith, and this should give you encouragement to continue to stay, stay steadfast under the trial. He's pointing to trials that have happened as badges of honor. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying enjoy pain and suffering. But what I am saying is don't be ashamed when you're walking through that struggle. Don't be ashamed when you're walking through the meat grinder because it's nothing to be ashamed about. Every Christian, every believer in God from the beginning of time until the end of time will face trials and struggles and difficulties. Embrace it. When your brothers and sisters ask what's going on, tell them. Because they're there to struggle with you. They're there to bear your burdens with you. They're there to be right beside you in the flames. And in reality, you don't have anything to be ashamed of when you're facing those, t- those trials and temptations because you can look at them a full, in full assurance and know that they have faced the exact same kinds of things. You might be surprised at the answer when they go, brother, I was just there last week and I can tell you that, the door, that, that it's coming. The victory is coming. I was there. Hang on just a moment longer. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. 
So here Peter is turning around and telling them, he goes, don't be surprised at trials. It's part of the Christian life. It's part of it. We all face them, okay? Every single one of us does. And if all of that evidence is not good enough, I want you to take a look back at the book of Matthew, which I did have marked, and then I've lost that mark. So bear with me just one second as we flip back to Matthew chapter number four. I'm going to read 11 verses to you real quick. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it, he, but he answered it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the devil took him up to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Jesus facing trials. Right after the baptism. Facing trials and temptations. If Jesus is facing those struggles and those difficulties... Would you look down and say anything lesser of him? No one would. No one would dare. Do not be ashamed of the trial. Okay? Don't be. Embrace the trial. Embrace the truth and the reality of the fact that you're going to face them. That's not a bad thing. It's not something for you to feel like, oh, I faced this trial. Why would I, why would I struggle with this? Because I, I should have been better. No. No. They're a part of life. They're a part of the Christian way of living. And likewise, when you look at your other brothers and sisters, if your temptation is to say, well, man, I mean, they went through this. I don't know. That's a mark. Because if you go back and look at the, at the book of Job, that's exactly what they did to their friend. They turned to look at him and said, mm, you're a sinner. You probably ought to just repent. Now, I'm not saying sometimes that may not, be the, may not be the advice we have to give to someone and say, well, look, you, you've walked in a way that you shouldn't come back to the Lord, brother. But there's a difference in saying that in love to someone and going, please, come back to the Lord, for the Lord's arms are wide open and willing to forgive you, and going to somebody in condemnation and saying, you, you faced a trial. You're a dirty Christian. You're not, you're not worth it. Mm, mm, that makes me better. No. Remember, you face trials too, and if you're not facing them now, you probably will be very soon. Trials are normal. There's nothing to be ashamed of. There's nothing to feel bad about. There's nothing at all to say, look, we will face them. We are going to face them in times of difficulty. Now, I say all that because I wanted to open us up to being very real very quickly, all right? We needed to break that, that, we needed to break that opening layer off, off of this thing so we could get inside of it and start really working down through the rest of it. We have to break that facade, all right? We have to be real with one another. We have to be open and vulnerable. That's dangerous and scary, I know. We have to be willing to look at one another and go, I am facing trials, all right? I have faced them. I've struggled with them. And, and, and because of that, I don't, I don't necessarily feel, I don't feel as good as what I probably could. I was going to do an exercise this morning, but I, we'll just do it as a thought experiment instead of having you guys raise your hands. I want you to think in your mind right now, across this church and think of anyone that you would consider a mentor in the faith, somebody that you look at and say, if I only prayed as much as they do, if I only read my Bible or known my scripture as much and as well as they do, if only, if only I had walked, or if only I had I had the wisdom that brother or sister so-and-so has, you look at them and you go, that's somebody that's somebody that I want to emulate. That's somebody that I want, I, want to, I want to be like that person. If I could just get to there in my own faith life, I would count that as a big win. 
usually every one of us can think of at least one person in the church and we go, there's somebody that I know is walking that path with Jesus and, and, and they're an example to me and they, they bolster me up. I'll be brave enough to admit that there are multiple, there are many of you in this church that I look at and say that about. My wife is one, brother Jason, Andrew, is, and his faithfulness is always an overwhelming testimony to me. That man comes in here, rain, shine, you name it, he is here hours early. And that to me, I'm like, jeez. I'm like, mm, if I had that kind of dedication and that kind of passion. He inspires me. He keeps me driving. I look at that man and I go, that's, that's a good Christian brother. Now I want you to think about this. Do any of you consider yourselves to be that person? Would any one person in here raise their hand and say, yep, I'm doing it right so much as I would want somebody to follow after me? Probably not. Probably no one would be so bold as to step up and say that. I bring that out to tell you this again, that your trials are not a problem. You're all facing them. You all feel, we all feel and struggle with the sense of worthiness to stand up and all that. It's all normal. It's absolutely normal. The trial is normal. Don't worry about that, okay? Be real with the person standing next to you. Be real about the struggles that you have with that person standing next to you. Come in here and go, hey, I'm hurting. I'm in pain. I struggle with this. Do you have any tips to do this with? Do you have any tips to make it through this? Be real and be vulnerable about the trials that you face. Now, now that we've gotten with this one, let's move on to another one. And uh, my sister may, may throw something at me here in a minute because I'm going to delve a little bit into her, her realm of study. The second great way that we can use to get real about trials is being mindful and meditating on the scriptures. Be mindful and meditate on the scriptures. There is a, there is a um, therapeutic technique called mindfulness. She's grinning at me already, which means I'm on, I'm on point. Hopefully I won't mess this, this definition up, all right? There is a therapeutic technique known as mindfulness. And, it's, it's, and this is an oversimplification. But mindfulness essentially tells you to take a moment, take a deep breath, and say, okay, and be in the moment. Become mindful of your feelings. Become mindful of all the things that are happening when, when those immense amounts of stress and things that are overwhelming you and, and are threatening to knock you off of your base. When that thing comes, you stop and you, you take stock. You become mindful and you live in the moment. Now, there are all kinds of different, there are all kinds of different techniques uh, and mindfulness exercises you can have, but every single one of them are designed to get your mind right. They're all designed to keep you from feeling overwhelmed and overburdened. Now, I'm not going way outside of Scripture here, but let's, let's take a look here in verse number two. I don't want you to feel like I'm just bringing in, in a psychological technique and saying this is, a, this is a practical matter. In verse number two, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now, I just said, let's get real about trials, right? How many of you would count it joy when you run into a trial? How many of you hit the trial and go, whew, boy, am I glad I'm in the trial today? Anyone? No? I, I didn't. I don't, okay? I, when I find trials, I go, oh, really? Another one? Whew, okay, yeah, all right, let's, let's, yeah, sure, let's do this, Lord. But more than likely, it's after the fact, after the trial, I'm like, oh, I messed up, okay? That's usually when I realized I was even in a trial. That's just me, okay? Trials. Trials will overwhelm us. They'll stress us. They'll drag us down. They like to beat on us relentlessly with the stress and the overwhelming force that comes in them. But what does James say right out of the beginning when he says, count it all joy? And I said he's being real, and he's a real-world writer, He's concerned with keeping it, keeping it absolutely 100% honest. And then he looks at us and says, count it all joy. So how is he doing this? Look at how he changes his mindset on these circumstances. When I say being mindful, that's exactly what he does. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. He's already stopping in the middle of these moments and saying, hmm, okay. I'm facing this trial. I'm facing this difficulty. I know what's coming, but I also know that if I stand firm, that the Lord is building a steadfastness in me 
and that steadfastness, starting in verse 4, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. He knows that this trial is working into him something, working something into him and making him and molding him into a, into a thing that is greater than what he is now. It is drawing him and making him more Christ-like. In fact, the, the specific uh, Greek word there for steadfastness is dokimion, which means to hammer out, to make perfect. It's, it's used and spoken about in the same way when they talk about making a metal perfect, pulling out the impurities little bit by little bit, making strong and powerful metal. This is the idea that he's brought forward here. So he's already stopping and taking stock in the middle of this, this thing. He's not saying he's enjoying it all. He said he's counting it all as a joyful thing. He's counting it all joy. He's changed his mindset. He's flipped the script on all of it by stopping for a moment and going, okay, I know what this is. I know what the Lord is doing through this entire situation. I know how I can, I know how I can make it through all of this. The Lord is working this all out for my good and his glory. He is working out in me a great and mighty steadfastness that will continue to make me more like Christ. He's taking stock in the moment. So when we face trials of of difficult times, I want us to practice a little bit of mindfulness. All right? To take a moment when you know that that difficult situation is coming that you're facing that overwhelming trial and the wave seems so large that you know that you're never going to make it through it, take a deep breath and meditate on what God's word has to say for you. God said that that he loves you in the trial and that he will never leave you or forsake you. So take a deep breath and think about it. If you have to, close your eyes. Focus on just those words from God in the midst of the trial and the difficulty. Breathing in breathing out. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse number six, God said, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. In the midst of your trial, in this difficult moment, the easiest thing for us to lose sight of is that God is right there, that he's not leaving you. He's not forsaking you. He's not far away or distant. He's not uncaring or unkind. He's standing right beside you, using this horrible moment, working in you a weight of glory, making you perfect moment by moment. And his own words to you said, don't be afraid, be strong and courageous. I will never leave you or forsake you. God has not lost control in this moment, but is working all things together for my good and his glory. This I can trust because he has told me so. In that moment, as you continue to think through the scriptures, as you continue to take stock of the moment and look at the trial for what it is, the feelings being whatever they are, frustration, denial, anger, whatever it happens to be in that moment, but stopping those feelings and going, okay, instead of letting them run off with you and take you off wherever they're going to run with, letting that heart drag you wherever it's going to drag you and stopping and saying, no, My God loves me. He's not forsaken me. He's not left me where I'm at. And instead, in this very moment, he's working it all out for my good. In Romans 5, verses 1 through 5, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that our sufferings produce endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Through sufferings comes hope. Because in that suffering, he builds about endurance, and through that endurance, he builds a a character that is strong and mighty, And in that moment when everything is overwhelming, you can stop and think, okay, no, no, I know I feel like I'm being overwhelmed. I know right now I feel like I can't make it through this difficult time. I know that I feel like I'm being crushed in this moment and broken. But instead, what did God tell me? No, God told me that this is going to produce a hope in me that can't be shaken. This is going to produce in me a character and a strength that comes from nowhere else. that builds me up into almost superhero-like status. 
Romans chapter 8, just a few just a few chapters later, in verse number 18, it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So when James gets to say, Count it all joy, my brothers, he can, he's living in that moment. He's telling his own mind that it's not worth comparing with that which is to come. It's not worth comparing with the great glory that God has in store for me. That great and mighty future that I can't even put into words a victory so large that it can't be overwhelmed, that has already been promised to me before time began. In that moment, when everything feels like it's falling apart, another deep breath, I consider that these sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that is to come. A few verses later, and still in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30, it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And I know that I stand in that moment with these people, that he is working everything out for my good and that I was already predestined to be conformed to him. I was already predestined to become like Christ, And in this moment, though it's difficult, though it's overwhelming, in this moment, I am being produced and moved towards glory, towards glorification. I am being brought, maybe kicking and screaming, but I am being drugged towards that moment. I am being made more like Christ because God has already promised that that's what he's doing through this. This is not a pointless suffering This is not a a trial that is not worth something in the end. This is something that's resulting in a great and mighty glory. Still yet further, and still in Romans chapter 8, verses 37 and 39, he says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus, our Lord. In that moment, when it feels like the enemy, whether within or without, is breaking you, you can say with absolute assurance that there is nothing that will separate you from that love. There is nothing that will break you to the point that it will snatch your salvation from you. I'm not saying you won't trip up or you won't fail, because we will. What I am saying is that God is good enough to forgive us in those moments and pick us up and use those moments to continue to drive us more like him. And in these, in these exact moments that are happening, we can say with absolute assurance, there is nothing in all of creation that will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, this next one is a bit, a bit lengthy, but I'm going to read through it anyway. Bear with me. Because it, it makes the point very, very strong. And... It's a good thing to meditate on, and I meditate on it often. Uh, and I don't say that as, a, as a, a bragging point, but I say it because it has been such a weighty passage on my own heart when things have gotten difficult and trying circumstances have just kicked me in the head and left me laying on the ground. Starting in Hebrews chapter number 11, in verse number 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made of the things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. He was not found because God had taken him. And now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land promised as a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. 
By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear when they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their, their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and when he had received the promises, was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was, even a, was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden, from, hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of, reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing, as seeing him who, who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, but she had, been, had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the power with power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. The world was not worthy. Wandering about in the deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. All, and all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted, and your struggle against sin you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. I read all of that. That's a lengthy passage, I know. But in that little passage there, you see the faith of all of those who suffered the trials, the difficulties, and the pain, and that God was faithful in every one of those moments to continue working out his plan of salvation moment by moment, second by second. None of these people were pulled out of that line. None of these people, despite their failings, if you look across that list, there are tons of failings in there. There are people who sinned and didn't do the right thing, left, right, and sideways. And every one of them is looked at and they say, by faith, these people succeeded. By faith, these people did great things. God continued to draw them each and every one towards glorification and towards an inheritance that was so big and so mighty. And so in those moments when it feels overwhelming, you can look back at not one, one witness, not one testimony, but a lineage that stretches back in your spiritual family all the way back to the very beginning moments of mankind. You can look at all of that and say, in this moment, not only has God promised me 
that he will hold on to me, but he has given me evidence that goes back farther than far, that there is not one human being that has ever existed that cannot look at this evidence and see the testimony of the mighty one. And I say, since I'm surrounded by that great cloud of witnesses, let me lay aside every weight and every sin and run this race with endurance so I can count it all joy. That is how James can say in realness, real world talk, that he can count it all joy when he encounters trials of various kinds. It's not high and mighty philosophical talk. It's real. Because when he stops and takes stock of everything and the reality of what's happening to him and of the fact that one day they will take him all the way to his death with him still professing this faith, He could look in that moment of death, stare it right in the eyes and say, no, the Lord Jesus Christ is the son of God. He came and died for me and rose again on the third day. And that resurrection has given me hope for new life. So go ahead, kill me. I can stand underneath this trial. Give me my crown of life because I'm ready. That's not fake talk. That's real talk. That's how he could count it all joy. Ooh, I'm running out of time. I'm sorry. All right, moving on to the very last thing here in James. Now, we've gotten through the first four verses here, right? We understand that trials are part of our Christian experience, and we understand that we can stand the test because we can be mindful and we can meditate on everything that God has promised us, everything that God has shown us, and those things can give us strength and courage to stand up to it, and likewise can give us hope if we happen to fail and fall down. He can, we can still go... That's okay, because God is faithful and has promised to forgive me. God is faithful and has promised to use this and work this out in my life. That's fine. One, one failure is not going to break me from glory because God is the one working that out in my life day in and day out. I'll get up and I'll move towards sanctification, not because I'm perfect, not because I'm great, but because my God happens to be. My God is so overwhelming that he's never going to let me fail or fail himself. And so the last one, coming from old Camel Knees himself, in verses 5 through 8, is pray. Pray, pray, pray. Now, again, we say this kind of thing often, right? I'll pray for you, brother. I'll be right there. I'll pray for you. And we mean it well. I'm not, don't ever think that that's not meant well. When people say that to you, they genuinely, they genuinely mean, All right, I, I will pray for you. Then the world will pull them in a thousand different directions. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. It's not out of a bad or malicious heart, Okay. I'm not trying, don't, don't feel like I'm throwing, throwing stones at anybody, okay? That's not what I'm trying to say. But we hear prayer so often said, pray, pray, pray. We should pray about this. You should pray about that. You should pray about the weather, about the things, but da, 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 you name it. We say it so often that it becomes cliche. And we go, is prayer really going to work at all? You're talking about being real. Right after all this, James recognizes the difficulty of having this kind of wisdom and of having this kind of moment-by-moment steadfastness. He knows how difficult this is, so he follows it up in verse number five. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven, tossed, driven and tossed by the wind, For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man and stable in all of his ways. So what does he mean by that last part? Let's tackle that first. What do you mean by doubting? Because if you say, I mean, I know when I get down on my knees and I pray, there's always that little element of doubt, okay? That's not the doubt he's talking about. The kind of doubt in view here is a doubt where you step up and you go, yeah, Lord, help me out. I know he's not gonna to, but help me. Please, Lord. Help me out here. I, I, wanna, I, want you to do, I want you to take care of my struggles. And then you go on and you do your own thing anyway. This is the kind of doubting he's talking about. A double-minded man. One, a man who might profess faith in Christ, but is still somebody who has absolutely no real, genuine faith that God was going to do anything. Not somebody who sits down on their knees and goes, Lord, I don't know if you'll say yes, but please help me in this moment. I beg you. That's a different kind of prayer. Okay, there's a different kind of thing there. Will God help me? I don't know if he will or not. I don't know if God's gonna answer yes, no, wait, whatever. That's a different kind. It's a different kind of doubt, right? It's not the doubt that's in mind here. 
All right, so don't feel like if you sit down on your knees and there's this, this flash of a moment where you go, I don't know what God's going to say to this, that that's going to suddenly draw you away from him. All right? That's not what's being said. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And if we know that he, will, that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So John is talking about having a big confidence in God responding to prayer. Now he says openly, if it's inside of God's will, so if you're praying outside, way outside of God's will, don't expect for that prayer to get answered, all right? And that's a prayer you don't want answered, not in reality. You don't want things that are outside of God's will taking place. Because God's will is what's absolutely best for you. Now, just later on in the same book of James, in chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, James will continue talking about prayer, and he says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Now here again, this is all part of a grander story, and this is all a prayer, because and this is all a prayer within, within the will of God, because it's showing the people of God that they have to be dependent on him. And go back and hit that story up, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. But here, a prayer inside of God's will is so strong as it can stop the weather itself. Rain is not even going to touch the earth for three years and six months. Not a drop of water, nowhere. And when, if your prayer is for wisdom, as he has talked about there, if your prayer is for the wisdom to stand up underneath these trials, if it's for the endurance, Father, to make it through this, if Father... Work out in me this glory, no matter what it happens to be. Teach me in this moment what I am to learn. These are the kinds of prayers that are going to get answered every single time. So pray. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here he's saying you have a high priest who has went through everything that you've gone through, has been tempted in every way that you have, and yet without sin. But what does that mean in real speak? In real world speaking, that means that God understands in full meaningness when you come to him with your hurt and your pain and the struggle of that trial, he gets it. Not like he gets it because he's the all-knowing God, but he gets it because he can look at you and say, I stood right where you stood at. I have faced temptation. I have faced trial. I have faced difficulty. Whatever it happens to be, I've faced it. I know the pain that you have. And I am your high priest making intercession on your behalf before the great and mighty God. I am the one that has opened up the veil so that you can enter into the throne room boldly. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 28 says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So those are those preceding passages, working everything back together. When we say pray, 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 pray. When you sit down and pray, The Spirit is praying with you. The Spirit is right there begging for you those things that you need that you don't even know that you need, those bits and pieces that you need worked out that that, that are just too deep for words are still being brought up before the Father. God is working this all out. So when I tell you to pray, I'm not saying pray and God doesn't understand. God fully understands. So I'm not asking you to pray a prayer of, of the high mighty prayer. You know what I'm talking about? When you come up before God and you say, God, Father, mighty, mighty one who, who is above sin and above reproach, oh, Lord, God, help me in my time of need. Thank you, amen. 
No, what I mean is those, those old school psalms, the Davidic prayers that come up and go, oh, my food is tears day and night. I am hurting. I am broken. It feels like you're a thousand miles away from me, God. It feels like you have dropped everything and have left me where I'm standing. I hurt so much and I can't understand this. Please help me. Real prayers. Real calling out to God because your high priest that stands there right beside God who is making intercession for you gets you. He's been there. He understands. You shouldn't feel afraid to come up to him and say, I, Lord, I hurt. I struggle. I'm still wrestling with this. He goes, I know. And I know what you need even more than you do. Come on. I got you. Good. So pray. Pray in all realness. Pray in all strength. And I know I'm way over here, but pray. And I want to close you out with this last verse. 